Roger Norwell and his double. The magistrate was ushered by the lady into a small chamber opening out of the entrance hall, which, in consequence of having only one small narrow window with a clipped yew tree before it, was extremely dark and gloomy. The walls were covered with sombre tapestry, and on entering, Mistress Nutter not only carefully closed the door, but drew the arrows before it, so as to prevent the possibility of their conversation being heard outside. These precautions taken, she motioned the magistrate to a chair, and seated herself opposite him. We can now deal unreservedly with each other, Master Norwell, she said, fixing her eyes steadily upon him, and as our discourse cannot be overheard and repeated, may use perfect freedom of speech. I am glad of it, replied Norwell, because it will save Kirkham Lucushan, which I dislike, and therefore, before proceeding further, I must tell you directly and distinctly that if there be aught of witchcraft in what you are about to cause me, I will have no to do with it, and our conference may as well never begin. Then you really believe me to be a witch, said the lady. I do, replied Norwell unflinchingly. Since you believe this, you must also believe that I have absolute power over you, rejoined the mistress nutter, and might strike you with sickness, cripple you, or kill you if I thought fit. I know not that, returned Norwell. There are limits even to the power of evil beings, and your charms and enchantments, however strong and baneful, may be wholly inoperative against a magistrate in the discharge of his duty. If it were not so, you would scarcely think it were wild to treat with me, um, exclaimed the lady. Now tell me frankly what you will do when you depart hence. Ride off with the utmost speed to Warley, replied Norwell, and acquainting Sir Ralph with all that has occurred, claim his assistance, and then, with all the force we can jointly muster, return hither and finish the work I have left undone. You will go this intention, said Mistress Nutter with a bitter smile. The magistrate shook his head. I am not easily turned from my purpose, he remarked, but you have not yet quitted roughly, said the lady, and after such an announcement I shall scarce think of parting with you. Dare not detain me, replied Norwell. I have Nicholas Asherton's word for my security, and I know he will not break it. Besides, you gain nothing by my detention. My absence will soon be discovered, and if living, I shall be set free. If dead, avenged. That may or may not be, replied Mistress Nutter, and in any case, I can, if I choose, wreak my vengeance upon you. I am glad to have ascertained your intentions, for I now know how to treat with you. You shall not go hence, except on certain conditions. You have said you will proclaim me a witch and will come back with sufficient force to accomplish my arrest. Instead of doing this, I advise you to return to Sir Ralph Asherton and admit to him that you find yourself in error in respect to the boundaries of the land. Never interrupted Norwell. I advise you to do this, sure the lady calmly. I advise you also, on quitting this room, to retract all you have uttered to my prejudice in the presence of Nicholas Asherton and other credible witnesses, in which case I will not only lay aside all feelings of animosity towards you, but will make over to you the whole of the land under dispute, and that without purchase money on your part. Roger Norwell was of an avaricious nature, and caught at the bait. How, madam, he cried, the whole of the land, mine without payment, the whole, she replied. If she should be arraigned and convicted, it will be forfeited to the crown, thought Norwell. The offer is tempting. Your attorney is here, and compare the conveyance at once, assured Mistress Nutter, as some can be stated to lend a colour to the proceeding, and I will give you a private memorandum that I will not claim it. All I require is that you clear me completely from the dark assertions cast upon my character, and you abandon your projects against my adopted daughter, Alison, as well as against those two poor old women, Mothers M.D. and Chattox. How can I be sure that I shall not be deluded in the matter, asked Norwell. The writing may disappear from the parchment you give me, or the parchment itself may turn to ashes. Such things have occurred in transactions with witches, or it may be that by consenting to the compact I will imperil my own soul. Tush! exclaimed Mistress Nutter. These are idle fears, but it is no idle threat on my part when I tell you you shall not go forth unless you consent. Cannot hinder me, woman, cried Norwell, rising. You shall see, rejoined the lady, making two or three rapid passes before him, which instantly stiffened his limbs and deprived him of power of motion. Now, sir, if you can, she added with a laugh. Norwell essayed to cry out, but his tongue refused its office. Hearing and sight, however, were left him, and he saw Mistress Nutter take a large volume bound in black from the shell and open it at a page covered with cabalistic characters, which, after she pronounced some words that sounded like an invocation, as she concluded, the tapestry against the wall was raised, and from behind it appeared a figure in all respects resembling the magistrate. It had the same sharp features, the same keen eyes and bushy eyebrows, the same stoop in the shoulders, the same habiliments. It was, in short, his double. Mistress Nutter regarded him with a look of triumph. Since you refuse with my injunctions, she said, your double will prove more 
intractable. He will go forth and do all I would have you do, while I have to stamp upon the floor, and a dungeon will yawn beneath your feet, where you will lie immured till doomsday. The same fate will attend your crafty associate, Master Potts, so that neither of you will be missed. Ha ha! The unfortunate magistrate fully comprehended his danger, but he could now neither offer remonstrance nor entreaty. What was passing in his breast seemed known to Mistress Nutter, but she motioned the double to stay, and touching the brow of Norwell with the point of her forefinger, instantly restored his power of speech. I will give you a last chance, she said. Will you obey me now? I must perforce, replied Norwell. The contest is too unequal. May retire then, she cried to the double, and stepping backwards, the figure lifted up the tapestry and disappeared behind it. I can breathe now, that infernal being is gone, cried Norwell, sinking into the chair. Oh, madam, you have indeed terrible power. You will do well not to brave it again, she rejoined. Shall I summon Master Potts to prepare the conveyance? Oh, no, no, cried Norwell. I do not desire the land. I will not have it. I shall pay too dearly for it. Only let me get out of this horrible place. Not so quickly, sir, rejoined Mistress Nutter. Before you go hence, I must find you to the performance of my my injunction. Pronounce these words after me. May I become subject to the fine if I fail in my promise? I will never utter them, cried Norwell, shuddering. Then I shall recall your double, said the lady. Hold, hold, exclaimed Norwell. Let me know what you require of me. I require absolute silence on your part, as to all you have seen and heard here. The cessation of hostility towards me and the persons I have already named, replied Mr. Snutter. And I require a declaration from you, in the presence of the two Washington, that you are fully satisfied of the justice of my claims in respect to the land and that mortified by your defeat you have brought a false charge against me, which you now sincerely regret. This I require from you, and you must ratify the promise by the abjunction I have proposed. May I become subject to the fine, and if I fail in my promise, the magistrate repeating the words after her, as he finished, mocking laughter apparently resounded from below, smote his ears. In no cried Mistress Nutter triumphantly, and now take good heed that you swerve not in the slightest degree from your word, or you are forever lost. Again the mocking laughter was heard, and Norwell would have rushed forth if Mistress Nutter had not withheld him. Stay, she cried, I have not done with you yet. My witnesses must hear your declaration, remember. And placing her finger upon her lip in token of silence, and stepping backwards, threw aside the tapestry, and opening the door, called to the two Ashertons, both whom instantly came to her, and were not a little surprised to learn that all differences had been adjusted, and that Roger Norwell acknowledged himself entirely in error, retracting all the charges he had brought against her, while on her part she was fully satisfied with the explanations, and apologies, and promise not to entertain any feelings of resentment towards him. You have made up the matter indeed, cried Nicholas, and as Roger Norwell is a widower, perhaps a match may come of it, such an arrangement. This is no occasion for jesting, Nicholas, interrupted the lady sharply. Nay, I but threw out a hint, rejoined the squire. It would set the question of the land forever at rest. It is set at rest forever, replied the lady, with a side look at the magistrate. May I become subject to the vine if I fail in my promise, repeated Norwell to himself. Though those words bind me like a chain of iron. I must get out of this accursed house as fast as I can. As if his thoughts had been divined by Mistress Nutter, she here observed to him, To make our reconciliation complete, Master Norwell, I must entreat you to pass the day with me. I will give you the best entertainment my house affords. Nay, I will take no denial. And you too, Nicholas, and you, Richard, you will stay and keep the worthy magistrate company. Two Ashertons willingly assented, but Roger Norwell would fain have been excused. A look, however, from his hostess enforced compliance. The proposal will be highly agreeable, I am sure, to Master Potts, remarked Nicholas with a laugh. For though much better in consequence of the balsam applied by Blackadder, he is scarcely in condition for the saddle. I will warrant him well tomorrow morning, said Mistress Nutter. Where is he? inquired Norwell. In the library with Parson Holden, replied Nicholas, making himself as comfortable as circumstances will permit, with a flask of Rhenish before him. I will go to him, then, said Norwell. Take care what you say to him, observed Mistress Nutter in a low tone, and raising her finger to her lips. Even the deep side, the magistrate then repaired to the library, a small room panelled with black oak and furnished with a few cases of ancient tomes. The attorney and the divine were seated at a table with a big square built bottle and long stemmed glasses before them. And Master Potts, with a wry grimace, excused himself from rising on his respected and singular good client's approach. Do not disturb yourself, said Norwell roughly. We shall not leave roughly today. I am glad to hear it, replied Potts, moving the cushions on his chair and eyeing the square built bottle affectionately. No tomorrow, it may be, no the day after. Nor at all, possibly, said Norwell. Indeed, exclaimed Potts, starting and wincing with pain. What is the meaning of all this, worthy sir? May I become the subject of the finding if I fail in my promise, rejoined Norwell with a groan. What promise, worshipful sir? cried Potts, staring with surprise. The magistrate got out the words, my promise too, and then he stopped suddenly to Mr. 
just not a suggestive part. Don't ask me, exclaimed Norwell fiercely. Don't draw any erroneous conclusion, man. I mean nothing. I say nothing. He is certainly bewitched, observed Parson Holden in an undertone to the attorney. It was by your advice I entered this house, thundered Norwell. I may all the ill arising from me a light on your head. My respected client implored Pots. I am no longer your client, Shree, the infuriated magistrate. I dismiss you. I will have no to do with you, Ma. I wish I had never seen your ugly little face. You were quite right, Reverend Sir, observed Potts aside to the divine. He is certainly bewitched, or he never would be behaving this way to his best friend. My excellent sir, he added to Norwell, I beseech you to calm yourself and listen to me. My motive for wishing you to comply with Mistress Nutter's request was this. We were in a dilemma from which there was no escape. My wounded condition preventing me from flight and all your followers being dispersed. Knowing your discretion, I apprehend that finding the tables turned against you, you would not desire to play a losing game, and I therefore counsel apparent submission as the best means of disarming your antagonist. Whatever arrangement you have made with Mistress Nutter is neither morally nor legally binding upon you. You think not, cried Norwell, may I become subject to the fine if I violate my promise? What promise have you made, sir? inquired Potts and Holden together. Do not question me, cried Norwell. It is sufficient that I am tied and bound by it. The attorney reflected a little and then observed Holden. It is evident some unfair practices have been resorted to with our respected friend to exhort a promise from him which he cannot violate. It is also possible from what he let fall at first that an attempt may be made to detain us prisoners within this house, and for all time nor Master Norwell may have given his word not to go forth without Mistress Nutter's permission. Under these circumstances, I would beg of you, Reverend Sir, as an especial favour to us all, to ride over to Warley and acquaint Sir Ralph Ashton with our situation. As this suggestion was made, Norwell's countenance brightened up. The expression was not lost upon the attorney, who perceived he was on the right tack. Tell the worthy baronet, continued Potts, that his old and esteemed friend, Master Roger Norwell, is in great jeopardy. Am I not right, sir? The magistrate nodded. Tell him he is forcibly detained a prisoner and requires sufficient force to effect his immediate liberation. Tell him also that Master Norwell charges Mistress Nutter with robbing him of his land by witchcraft. No, no, interrupted Norwell. Do not tell him that. I no longer charge her with it. Then tell him that I do, cried Potts, and that Master Norwell has strangely, very strangely altered his mind. May I become subject to the bind if I violate my promise, said the magistrate. I tell him that, cried the attorney. Tell him the worthy gentleman is constantly repeating that sentence. It will explain all. And now, reverend sir, let me entreat you to set out without delay or your departure may be prevented. I will go at once, said Holden. As he was about to quit the apartment, Mistress Nutter appeared at the door. Confusion was painted on the countenances of all three. Whither go you, sir? demanded the lady sharply. On a mission which cannot be delayed, madam, replied Holden. You cannot quit my house at present, she rejoined peremptorily. These gentlemen stay to dine with me, and I cannot dispense with your company. My duty calls me hence, returned the divine. With all thanks for your proffered hospitality, I must perforce decline it. Not when I command you to stay, she rejoined, raising her hand. I am absolute mistress here. Not over the servants of heaven, madam, replied the divine, taking the Bible from his pocket and placing it before him. By this sacred volume, I shield myself against your spells and command you to let me pass. And as he went forth, Mistress Nutter, unable to oppose him, shrank back. Mother Demdi, the heavy rain which began to fall as Roger Norwell entered roughly and now ceased, and the sun shone forth again brilliantly, making the garden look so fresh and beautiful that Richard proposed to stroll within it to Alison. The young girl seemed doubtful at first whether to comply with the invitation, but she finally assented, and they went forth together alone, for Nicholas, fancying their good defence with his company, only attended them as far as the door where he remained looking after them, laughing to himself and wondering how matters would end. No good will come of it, I fear, mused the worthy squire, shaking his head. And I am scarcely doing right in allowing Dick to entangle himself in this fashion. But where is the use of giving advice to a young man who is overhead and ears in love? He will never listen to it and will only resent interference. Dick must take his chance. I have already pointed out danger to him. And if he chooses to run headlong into the pit, why I cannot hinder him at all, I am not much surprised. Alison's beauty is quite irresistible and were all smooth and straightforward in her history. There could be no reason why I am as foolish as the lad himself. Sir Ralph Asherton, the proudest man in the Shire, would disown his son if he married against her inclination. No, my pretty youthful pair, since nothing but misery awaits you, I advise you to make the most of your brief season of happiness. I should certainly do so were the case my own. Meanwhile, the objects of these ruminations had reached the terrace overlooking Pendle Water and were pacing slowly backwards and forwards along it. One might be very happy in this sequestered spot, Alison observed Richard some person
lessons it might be at all, but to me, blessed with you, it would be little short of paradise. Alas, Richard, she replied, forcing a smile, why conjure up visions of happiness which never can be realised? Even with you, I do not think I'd be happy here. There is something about the house which, when I first beheld it, filled me with unaccountable terror. Never since I was a mere infant have I been within it till today, and yet it was quite familiar to me, horribly familiar. I knew the hall in which we stood together with a huge arched fireplace and the armorial bearings upon it, and could point out stone on which were carved my father's initials, RN with the date 1572. I knew the tapestry on the walls and the painted glass in the long range of windows. I knew the old oak staircase and the gallery beyond it, and the room to which my mother led me. I knew the portraits painted on the panel, and at once recognised my father. I knew the great carved oak bedstead in this room, and the high chimney piece, and the raised hearth sun, and shuddered as I gazed at it. You will ask me how these things be familiar to me. I will tell you. I had seen them repeatedly in my dream. They have haunted me for years, but I only today knew they had an actual existence, or were in any way connected with my own history. The sight of that house inspired me with a horror I have not been able to overcome, and I have a presentiment that some ill will befall me within it. I would never willingly dwell there. The warning voice within you, which should never be despised, prompts you to quit it, cried Richard, and I also urge you in like manner. In vain, sighed Alison. This terrace is beautiful, she added, as they resumed their walk, and I shall often come hither if I am permitted, as sunset this river and the woody heights above it must be enchanting, and I do not dislike the savage character of the surrounding scenery. It enhances by contrast the beauty of this solitude. I only wish the spot commanded of you a pendle hill. You are like my cousin Nicholas, who thinks no prospect complete unless that hill form part of it, said Richard. But since I find that you will often come hither at sunset, I shall not despair of seeing and conversing with you again, even if I am forbidden the house by Mistress Nutter. That thicket is an excellent hiding place, and this stream is easily crossed. We can have no secret interviews, Richard, replied Alison. I shall come hither to think of you, but not to meet you. You must never return to Rovely again. That is unless some change takes place, which I dare not anticipate. But heist, I am cold. I must go back to the house. The voice came from the other side of the river, said Richard, and hark, it calls again. Who can it be? It is Janet, replied Alison. I see her now. And she pointed out the little girl standing beside an older on the opposite bank. It did not notice me before Alison, cried Janet in her sharp tone. And with her customary walking laugh, for I see you plain enough and hear you too. And I heard Master Rudshot say he would hide by this thicket and cross the river to meet ye at sunset. Little pigs, they say, I lang ears and mine were not getting me for no. They have somewhat misinformed you in this instance, replied Alison. But how in the name of wonder did you come here? Very easily, replied Janet. But I had no time to tell ye now. Granny Demdi has sent me hither with a message to ye and Mistress Nutter. But maybe you wanna like Master Rudshot to hear what he again tell you. I will leave you, said Richard, about to part. Oh, no, no, cried Alison. She can have nothing to say with you may not hear. Shan't I go back to Granny Demdi and tell her you're too proud to receive her message? Asked the child. On no account, whispered Richard. Do not let her anger the old hag. Speak, Janet, said Alison in a tone of kind persuasion. I shanna speak unless you come over to wetter to me, replied the little girl. And what I had to tell concerns ye, Mish. I can easily cross, observed Alison to Richard. Those stones seem placed on purpose. Upon this, descending from the terrace to the river's ring, the springing lightly upon the first stone which reared its head above home in tide, she bounded to an another, and so in an instant was across the street. Richard saw her ascend the opposite bank, and approach Janet, who withheld behind the older, and then he fancied he perceived an old bow there, partly concealed by the intervening branches of the tree, advanced and seized hold of her. Then there was a scream, and the sound of scarcely reached a young man's ears, for he was down the bank and across the river, but when he reached the older, neither Alison nor Janet nor the old bell dame were to be seen. The terrible conviction that she had been carried off by over them the then smote him, and search for her among the adjoining bushes. It was with fearful misgivings. No answer was returned to his shouts, nor could he discover any trace of the means by which Alison had been spirited away. After some time spent in ineffectual search, uncertain what was pursued, and with a heart full of despair, Richard crossed the river and proceeded towards the house, in front of which he found Mistress Nutter and Nicholas, both of whom seemed surprised when they seemed he was unaccompanied by Alison. The lady immediately and somewhat sharply questioned him as to what had become of her adopted daughter, and appeared at first to doubt his answers, but at length unable to question his sincerity, she became violently agitated. The poor girl was being conveyed away by the other lady she died over what her son had lost to conceive. The old hag across the river water, and therefore resorted to 
that strategy of Alison must not be left in her hands, madam, said Richard. She must not, reply the lady. Black Adder, whom I have sent after Parson Holden, were here. I will dispatch him immediately to Malton Tower. I will go instead, said Richard. You had better accept his offer. And towards Nicholas, he will serve you as well as Black Adder. Go, I shall, madam, cried Richard. If not on your account, on my own. Come then with me, said the lady, entering the house, and I will furnish you with that which shall be your safeguard in the enterprise. With this, she proceeded to the closet where her interview with Roger Norwell had been held, and unlocking an ebony cabinet, took from a drawer within it a small flat piece of gold, graven with misty characters, and having a slender chain of the same metal attached to it. Throwing the chain over Richard's neck, she said, Place this talesman, which is of sovereign virtue, near your heart, and no witchcraft shall have power over you. But be careful that you are not by any artifice deprived of it, for the old hag will soon discover that you possess some charm to protect you against her spell. You are impatient to be gone, but I have not yet done, she continued, taking down a small silver bugle from my pocket and giving it him. On reaching Malkin Tower, win this horn thrice, and the old witch will appear at the other window. Demand admittance in my name, and she will not dare to refuse you. Or if she does, tell her you know the secret entrance to her stronghold, and you will have recourse to it. And in case this should be needful, I will now disclose it to you, but you must not use it till other means fail. When on the door, which you will find is high up in the building, take ten paces to the left, and if you examine the masonry at the top of the tower, you perceive one stone somewhat darker than the rest. At the bottom of this stone, and concealed by a patch of heath, you will discover a knob of iron. Touch it, and it will give you an opening to a vault chamber, whence you can mount to the upper room. Even then, you may experience some difficulty, but with resolution, you will surmount all obstacles. I have no fear of success, madam, replied Richard confidently, and quitting her, he proceeded to the stable, and calling for his horse, vaulted it into the saddle, and galloped off towards the bridge. Fast as Richard rode up the steep hillside, still faster did black clouds gather over his head. No natural cause could have produced so instantaneous a change in the aspect of the sky. The young man viewed it with uneasiness, and wished to get out of the thicket in which he was now involved. Before the threatened thunderstorm commenced, the hill was steep, and the road by being all of loose stone, and crossed in many places by bare roots trees. So ordinarily sure-footed, Merlin stumbled frequently, and Richard was obliged to slacken his speed. It grew darker and darker, and the storm seemed ready to burst upon him. The smaller birds ceased singing, and screened themselves under the wicked foliage. The pie chattered incessantly. The jay screamed. The bittern flew past, booming heavily in the air. The raven croaked. The heron arose from the river, and speeded off with his long neck stretched out. And the falcon, who had been hovering over him, sweet sad long down, and sought shelter beneath an impending rock. The rabbit scuttled off to his burrow in the break, and the hare erected himself for a moment, as if to listen to the note of danger, crept timorously off into the long dry grass. It grew so dark at last that the road was difficult to discern, and the dense rows of trees on either side assumed a fantastic appearance in the deep gloom. Richard was now more than halfway up the hill, and the thicket had become more tangled with intricate, and the road narrower and more rugged. All at once Merlin stopped, quivering in every limb, as if in extremity of terror. Before the rider, and right in his path, glared a pair of red fiery orbs, with something dusky and obscure linked to them. But whether of man or beast he could not distinguish, Richard called to it. No answer. He struck spurs into the reeking flanks of his horse. The animal refused to stir. Just then, there was a moaning sound in the wood, as of someone in pain. He turned in the direction, shouted, but received no answer. When he looked back, the red eyes were gone. Then Merlin moved forward of his own accord. But ere he had gone far, the eyes were visible again, glaring at the rider from the wood. This time they approached, dilating and increasing in glowing intensity, till they searched him by burning glasses. Bethinking him of the talesman, Richard drew it forth. The light was instantly extinguished, and the indistinct figure accompanying it melted into darkness. Once more, Merlin resumed his toilsome way, and Richard was marvelling that the storm so long suspended its fury when the sky was riven by a sudden blaze, and the cracking bolt shot down and struck the earth at his feet. A frightened steed reared aloft, and was with difficulty prevented from falling backwards upon his rider. Almost before he could be brought to his feet, an awful peal of thunder burst all red, and required Richard's utmost efforts to prevent him from rushing madly down the hill. The storm had now fairly commenced. Flash! Followed flash, and peal succeeded heel without intermission. The rain descended, hissing and spouting, presently ran down the hill in the torrent, aiding to the horsemen over difficulties and dangers. To heighten the terror of the scene, strange shapes revealed by the lightning were seen, flitting amongst the trees, and strange sounds were heard, though overpowered by the dreadful rolling of thunder. But Richard's resolution continued unshaken, and he forced Merlin on. He had not proceeded far, however, when the animal uttered a cry of right, and began beating the air with his forehoof. The lightning enabled Richard to discern the cause of his new distress, called round the poor beast's legs, all whose efforts to disengage himself from the terrible assailant were ineffectual. It was a large glass seemingly about hundred poisonous fangs into flesh. Again, having 
roaring recourse to the talesman, and bending down, Richard stretched it towards the snake, upon which the reptile instantly darted its arrow-shaped head against him, but instead of wounding him, its four teeth encountered a piece of gold, and if stricken a violent blow, it swiftly untwined itself, and fled hissing into the thicket. Richard was now obliged to dismount, and lead his horse. In this way, he toiled slowly up the hill, the storm continued with unabated fury, the red lightning played around him, the rattling thunder stunned him, and the pelting rain poured upon his head, but he was no more molested, save for the vivid flashes. It had become dark as night, so they searched to guide him on his way. At length he got out of the thicket and trod upon the turf, but it was rendered so slippery by moisture that he could scarcely keep his feet, while the lightning no longer aided him, fearing he had taken the wrong course. He stood still, and while debating with himself, a blaze of light illuminated the wide heat and showed him the object of his search, a tower standing alone like a beacon at about a quarter of a mile's distance. On the farther side of the hill, was it his stern fancy, or did he really behold it on the summit of the structure, a grisly shape resembling, if it resembled anything human, a gigantic black hat moving, staring, skin and flaming eye, all moved by the sight of a tower, Richard was on his seat back in an instant, an animal having in some degree recovered his spirit, galloped off with him, and kept his feet in sight, a slippery state of road, he along another flash showed a young man that he was rowing rapidly near tower, and dismounting, he tied her to a tree, and her it was a hammer pile, when within twenty paces of it, mindful of the mistress nutter's injunction, placed the bugle to his lips, and wind it thrice. The summons, though clear and loud, sounded strangely in the pretentious silence. Scarcely had the last note died away, when a light shone through the dark curtains, hanging before a casement in the upper part of the tower. The next moment, these were drawn aside, and base gear, so frightful, so charged with infernal wickedness and malice, that Richard's blood grew chill at the sight. Was it man or woman, the white beard and the large broad, masculine character of the countess, he didn't know the former. The garb was that of a female, the face was at once hideous and fantastic, the eyes set across the mouth of right, the right heat marked by a mole shining black hair, horrible from the contrast to the rest of his scene, and the brow branded as if by a sweet blood, the black from cat constituted old witches, and yet from beneath it a hoary hair escaped in long elf locks, the lower part of her person was hidden from view, but she appeared to be as broad shouldered as a man, and a bull person was wrapped in a tawny colour. Throwing open the window, she looked forth, demanded in harsh, imperious tone, Who dares to summon Mother Demdi? A messenger from the mistress Nutter replied, Richard, I am come in her name to demand the restitution of Alison Device, whom thou hast forcibly and wrongfully taken from her. Alison Device is my granddaughter, and as such she belongs to me, and not to Mistress Nutter, rejoined Mother Demdi. Thou knowest thou speakest false, foul, I cried, Richard. Alison is no blood of thine. Open the door, and cast down the ladder, or I will find other means of entrance. Try them then, rejoined Mother Demdi. And she closed the casement sharply and drew the curtain over it. After reconnoitring the building for a moment, Richard moved quickly to the left, and counting ten paces, a directed by Mr. Snudder, began to search among the big grass growing near the base of the tower, the concealed entrance. It was too dark to distinguish any difference in the colour of the masonry, but he was sure he could not be far wrong, and presently his hand came into contact with a knob of iron. He pressed it, but it did not yield to the touch. Again, more forcibly, but with light ill success. Would he be mistaken? He tried the next stone, and discovered another knob upon it, but this was as immovable as first. He went on, and then found that each stone was alike, and that if amongst the number he had chanced upon the one worked by the secret spring he had refused to act. On examining the structure so far as he was able to do in the gloom, he found he had described a whole circle of the tower, and was about to commence the search anew, when a creaking sound was heardable, and a light streamed suddenly down upon him. The door had been opened by the old witch, and she stood there with a lamp in her hand, its yellow flame illuminating her hideous visage, the short, square, powerfully built frame. Her throat was like that of a bull, her hands of extraordinary size, and her arms which were bare to the shoulder, brawny and muscular. What's still outside? she cried in a jeering tone, and with a wild discordant laugh. Before thou affirmest thou couldest find a way into my dwelling, I do not yet despair of finding it, replied Richard. Fool, screamed the hag, I tell thee it is in vain to attempt it without my consent. With a word, I could make these walls one solid mass, without window or outlet, from base to summit. With a word, I could shower stones upon thy head and crush thee to dust. With a word, I could make the earth swallow thee up. With a word, I could whisk thee hence to the top end of the hill. Ha ha, dost fear me now? No, replied Richard, undauntedly, and the word thou meanest me which shall never be uttered. Why not? asked the mother of MD derisively. Because thou wouldst not brave the resentment of one whose power is equal to thine own, if not greater, replied the young man. Great it is not equal, neither, rejoined the old hag haughtily. But I do not desire a quarrel with Alice Nutter. Only let her not meddle with me. Once more art thou willing to admit me, demanded Richard. I, upon one condition, replied Mother MD, thou shalt learn it anon. Stand aside while I let down the ladder. Richard obeyed, and a pair of narrow wooden steps 
the ground. Now mount if thou hast the courage, cried I. The young man was instantly beside her, she stood in the doorway, and barred his further progress with her extended staff. Now that he was face to face with her, he wondered at his own temerity. There was nothing human in her countenance, an infernal light gleamed in her strangely set eyes. Her personal strength, evidently unimpaired by age or preserved by magical art, seemed equal to her malice, and she appeared as capable of executing any atrocity as of conceiving it. She saw the effect produced upon him, and chuckled with malicious satisfaction. So as thou ever face like mine, she cried, no, I was not, but I would rather inspire aversion and terror than love. Love, or I would rather see men shrink from me and shudder at my approach, than smile upon me and call to me. I would rather freeze the blood in their veins than set it boiling with passion. Oh, oh, thou art a fearful being indeed, exclaimed Richard Hall. Fearful am I, ejaculated the old witch with renewed laughter. Alas, thou ownst it. Why I am fearful? It is my wish to be so. I live to plague mankind, to blight and blast them, to scare them with my love, to work them mischief. Oh, oh, and now let us look at thee, she continued, holding the lamp over him. Why so a comely you and the young maid dote on thee? I doubt not, praise thy blooming cheek, thy bright eyes, thy flowing locks, and thy fine limb. I hate thy beauty, boy, and would mar it, would canker thy holes and flesh, dim thy lustrous eyes, and strike thy vigorous limb to palsy, till they should shake like mine. I am half minded to do it, she added, raising her staff and glaring at him with inconceivable malignity. Oh, exclaimed Richard, taking the talisman from his breast and displaying it to her, I am armed against thy malice. Mother Demdee's staff fell from her grasp. I knew thou wert in some way to she cried furiously, and so it is a piece of gold with magic characters upon it. Eh, she added, suddenly changing her tone. Let me look at it. Thou seest it plain in no rejoined Richard. Now stand aside and let me pass. Thou perceivest I have power to force an entrance. I see it, I see it, replied Mother Demdee with affected humility. I see it is in vain to struggle with thee, or rather with the potent lady who sent thee. Tarry where thou art, and I will bring Alice to thee. I almost mistrust thee, said Richard. Be speedy. I will be scarce a moment, said which but I must warn thee that she is. What, what hast thou done to her, thou wicked hag? cried Richard in alarm. She is distraught, said Mother Demdee. Distraught, echoed Richard. Thou can't easily cure her, said the old hag significantly. Aye, so I can, cried Richard with sudden joy. The talesman, bring her to me at once. Mother Demdee departed, leaving him in a state of indescribable agitation. The walls of the tower were of immense thickness, and the entrance to the chamber towards which the arched doorway led was covered by a curtain of old arrows, behind which the hag had disappeared. Scarcely had she entered the room when a scream was heard, and Richard heard his own name pronounced by a voice which, in spite of his agonised tone, he at once recognised the cries were repeated, and he then heard Mother Demdee call out, Come hither, come hither. Instantly rushing forward, dashing aside the tapestry, he found himself in a mysterious looking circular chamber with a massive oak table in the midst of it. There were many strange objects in the room, but he saw only Alison, who was struggling with old witch and clinging desperately to the table. He called to her by name as he advanced, but her bewildered looks proved that she did not know him. Alison, dear Alison, I am come to free you, he exclaimed, but in place of answering him, she uttered a piercing scream. The talesman, the talesman, cried the hag, I cannot undo my own work. Place the chain around her neck and the gold near her heart, that she may experience its full virtue. Richard unsuspectingly complied with the suggestion of the temptress, but the moment he had parted with a piece of gold, the figure of Alison vanished. The chamber was buried in gloom, and amidst a hubbub of wild laughter, he was dragged by the powerful arm of the witch through the arched doorway and flung from it to the ground, the shot of the hall producing immediate insensibility.